So everybody, uh, you can go ahead and, and keep eating, and I'll talk about the temple in our time, and I'll take any questions you have as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere and fillest all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. So even when we begin with the prayer of O Heavenly King, we're asking to become his temple, so that he abides in us and with us. So that's the first thing. Every, before we begin any prayers in the church, we always ask the Holy Spirit to come into our heart. Because what's happening on the outside of us within the temples we're in has to first come from what's inside of us. So we really project uh, into the space that we have in the church. Therefore, if we're not bringing the light of Christ with us, we can't turn the light of Christ on in the temple. So in other words, we have to be on before we get there. See, if we're off, then we can turn all the lights on. Now, if I keep going with this, you're going to wonder, is Bishop Anthony on or off? <laughs> but uh, if we're spiritually off, or if we're only on, uh, if we're on mute or wherever, we can't really do anything. We're in a holding pattern like a plane that's flying overhead that can't land. We have to land, and the only way is for us to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 regarding that. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? <clears throat> for you are God's temple. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You're bought with the price of Christ on the cross. He paid for us. You know, the word in, uh, for redemption is ransom. In the Greek, it's used in two, two Greek words. Letro <clears throat> is, is one word. And agorazo, which uh, is the marketplace. You, you buy from the marketplace. So what Jesus did is he bought us for himself. He brought us, he bought us from captivity, from the litro, and he bought us for himself. So we don't, a redemption is a buying of something, not only back, but for me to keep. I'm not just freeing you, I'm now possessing you. We go and take communion in the church all we're doing is strengthening and nourishing that in adorning, I could say adorning and adoring God's temple in us. So, and in fact, if we take communion not thinking that we're the temple of God, but we belong to ourselves, we're inviting a stranger into us. Because he's, we're just doing something that doesn't belong to us because we don't belong to him. So there has to be a correspondence between the communion we're taking in church and the community we are with Christ. We're a community with Christ. So that's why we're taking the communion in Christ. But if we don't belong to him, if we think that we belong to us alone and that we're born and we have our own self-determination, then really Jesus is just an invited guest. How can God be an invited guest? Aren't we the invited guest? Well, we got to really be kind of odd <laughs> to think that, yeah, you're welcome to visit anytime you want, God. <laughs> but that's the way it is in a world where people think that they determine everything for themselves. <clears throat> I could go beyond all of this, in fact, say, if you don't believe you're the temple of God, your body is the temple of God, then, 
really, God is just something you think about. But it's not material for you. It's not furnishing your house. There's no furniture in there. There's just a wall. I like my chancery right now. I don't know if that got somehow a metaphor in there. But it's not, it's not. You were, you, you were right, Jerry. I was going to kind of go there. And in that regard, I want to mention something in the post-communion prayers, the prayers after communion. I don't know how many say this, but <clears throat> it's very good to remember that show me to be a temple of the one spirit and not the home of many sins. So we're the, we're the temple of the one spirit and not the home of many sins. We, we are made firm in our faith through becoming a tabernacle through communion. It's very beautifully said. May every evil thing flee as before fire, that I might become a tabernacle through communion. Through commun everything I just said. I offer thee as intercessors all the saints and the angels and the forerunners and the apostles and especially our blameless mother. Well, that's where our family is. See, unless we're a part of that temple, unless we make Christ home for us through Holy Communion, becoming that tabernacle, as it says in this prayer of thanksgiving, then we're not, we don't have anybody that we're related to. Not the saints, not the angels, not the apostles, not the holy hierarchs, not the martyrs. We're strangers in our own house. Do you ever feel like a stranger in your own house? Well, I don't want to get too existential with all of this. But am I being clear about the being important to be the temple of God? That's where I need to start when I think about a temple in our times. And if I could comment on modern situations, people are claiming their bodies and souls for themselves. This is what I want myself to be. Well, then you can't, you, 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 you're not bought with a price. You're still your own. You're, you're believing in Christ, maybe, or, but you then adjust Him to what you want Him to be rather than entering into him and making yourself part of his temple and you by, thereby extending his life into you, you're just claiming it all for yourself. And if you do, then I suppose logically or rationally, you can make yourself whatever you want it to be. But then you have to say, am I an image and likeness of God? See, if God says we're made in his image and likeness, and God says that he wants to make his home with us, as he does in the 14th chapter of St. John, and thereby we become a temple of God. And if Christ said, I have bought you and purchased you with a price, then if you're outside of that, then guess what happens? You're your own image too. Not only are you detached from God and you claim your body as your own and you haven't been sold out to Christ and therefore you're not possessed by God, you know, it goes... And it's like hand and glove. If, you don't, if you're not possessed by God, you can't maintain the image in yourself anymore. Because then you have to make up your own image of yourself. And what is that? Idolatry. Either we reflect the image of Christ, or we make ourselves our own image, or others an image, and that's idolatry. It's either iconography or idolatry. It's very interesting. People don't think through this like the bishop is. And that's why I stay at home and read my books. I <laughs> think through all of this, all of these very abstract things. And then, my, and they'll, they'll, that's very good, Bishop Anthony. That's good to hear that. But most people won't have time to do this. But I do have time to do this. I have time to analyze the culture in which we live. I think that's really the, the question. Am I possessed by God? And if I am, do I maintain the image and likeness of God in me? And if I do, what do I live for and who do I live for? But if I possess myself and I make up my own image, why do I live anyway? Because I have nothing to refer myself to. 
except me. That's why you'll find so much fervor and politicalization and radicalization in the world we live. Everybody's trying to affirm or validate what their own impression of themselves is. And so they're trying to get other people to be convinced of what they've already fantasized or made up about themselves. And if they have power to go along with it, who's to say no? If they have monetary, financial, political, economic, uh, social prominence or celebrity, then they can kind of coerce or persuade or charm people into thinking, this is who I really am. What we do have in the world now is people competing to be God. Because they're not in the temple of God and they haven't accepted the fact that they've been purchased with a price. But isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, to not really be... It's hard to say being raised in a world where independence and self-determination is such a high ideal. But I think in the liberty of Christ it can be. But outside of it, I don't want to be possessed by my own desires. I'd rather be possessed by God who loves me and who can direct me to use my energy in the right way. So if I were to choose the two, even if I am not, well, how can I not be who I am? That's another, I'm not going to tell you that. I, <laughs> if I could step outside of myself, it would seem to me the better option would be, why not go towards the God who made me and who wants to love me in great possession to make me his temple and to find direction for my energy in life and for my choices in life? Or do I make it up as I go, hesitating, failing, trying to persuade somebody that in my heart I don't even believe? Because how do you go to your deep heart and conscience when God is there and say, you're not there? It's like looking at me and saying, Bishop Anthony isn't there. Well, I'm 63, so I'm still here. I hope I'm here the next year too. But that not that really the question? I wanted to go over this important thing about you being in the temple of God. And I want to read the whole prayer now to finish my section on this, unless you have any questions. I know I was a little abstract in what I said, a little philosophical. But it really is an important question for us. Either we are in the temple and we are a temple, or we're going to set up our own religion of self. And the religion of self has no content. Yes? So is that similar to the fallen angels? You know, the yes. That they were equal to Christ and then God, and because they did not accept that, so that all these people who are self-determining are equally rejected and on their own, and the servants of who? Exactly, the servants of who? And that's well said, even of the adversary spirit. He's not happy being a servant of himself or being Lord of himself. You, you, we aren't created that way. See, we, we can't go against our own creation. That's Philosophically, that's nihilism, a believing in nothing. So how do you exist when you have no reference to make about who you exist for? You have to have that point. I mean, even isn't it true that when we're little and you have kids, they all have to have their parents as a reference point. I'm always mentioning my Rebecca. It's not mine. She's my niece, but it's always, I'm really close to her. So I, I have all of you as my children. But she, she really knew her uncle well. I was saying to uh, <clears throat> Craig and Cindy when I went with them, she was a very masterful rationalist at the age of two. <clears throat> she, would, she loved Tootsie Rolls. You remember during the Halloween time and they have these Tootsie packages where you have the fruit chews and the Tootsie Rolls and stuff like that? Well, she would take two of them and take a bite from each. And then she would say to me, it's not good to waste. At two years old. And, you know, I wasn't supposed to laugh at that. I was supposed to discipline that. 
but I didn't discipline it, and that ended all possibility of <laughs> discipline in the future. <laughs> so, but the reason I'm saying is, even though, even though she knew maybe she did wrong, she went to me as the reference point there for her life. And then you parents all have kids that go to you to determine how they should act with their thoughts or what they should do. And they'll get a yes or a no, and that gives them a direction or a balance in which to make their choice on. They may be very mad if you say no, but they would be more depressed if you said nothing. They would be more depressed if you said nothing. Being anger is much better than being depressed. Would you agree with that? Because it's still some energy somewhere. Well, that's what... With the, the devil point is when he cut himself off from being a creature in the image of God and made himself his own God and competed against God, then he had no point of validation or reference at all for his life. So he had to become it for himself. And this is interesting too. Even negatively, the adversary spirits, the, the enemies of God now who were created good, have a negative energy because they're trying to prove that they are someone. So it's, I want to affirm myself. And if I can no longer affirm myself positively and in a good way, because I'm the one that closed it up, I'm going to do it in a negative way. It's like the spoiled child that wants attention. So we could say that in one sense, it's the devil wanting attention. And my, does he get the attention. But he's dependent on that all the time. That's why he works incessantly, because his only sense of self is to control other things. The worst thing that will happen to him is when he can't control anything. When he won't have any lure of temptation to draw people into the web of his own negative existence, which is really a sad thing to say of any creature of God. That there will come a time when I really am nothing. So that's, an, that's exactly making an idol rather than an icon. And on this subject, it's kind of fascinating that, do you know, God has never removed from any of his creatures. Can everyone hear me? God did not remove from any of his creatures, the natural gifts he gave them. Even in his negative use of his gifts, God didn't take the gifts away. He's still a strong man. Didn't even, when a strong man enters into the house, 12th chapter of Matthew, and takes the goods, well, he had to enter somebody's strength themselves. So, God gave them the natural gifts, but they're misusing those natural gifts and they're misplacing those natural gifts. This is good for us to remember in the pastoral life that people coming to us with their passions and sins, they're still trying to assert themselves, but they're doing it in the wrong way. Our job is to redirect them to do it in the right way. Not that their energy is bad, but they're using it in the incorrect way. They're making themselves a temple by themselves and there's no one home. I mean, how do I build a home and I'm not in it or I'm the only one in it? Well, sometimes I am the only one in it. That's why I have to look in the mirror and say, oh, you look good today or whatever. I, I don't know, there's nobody there to say anything. So... But you have to have, you, you build your temple so that you got, invite God, God, God is there and he, you go into him. So let me just read this beautiful prayer of St. Simon Metaphrastes. And it says, Freely thou hast given me thy body for food, thou who art a fire consuming the unworthy. Consume me not, O my creator, but listen to this. Instead, enter into my members, my veins, my heart. And this is not just metaphorical. See, I want to remind you of that. This is truly entering into your body. 
Because your body was in baptism, entered into the body of Christ, see? So you become a cell in the body of Christ, right? You're an active, living, viable cell in the body of Christ in a way. And therefore, you have all the DNA that the whole body has. That means you have the whole DNA of Jesus Christ. You are baptized into his death for his resurrection, right? Chapter 6 of Romans. This is a very great thing. So you're going into... Sometimes we forget this. We don't look at it in a literal, physical way. But really, my veins, my, my heart, the heart that's a physical pumping organ is also the home of Christ and the Holy Trinity, as it says in the 14th chapter of St. John, which I've already mentioned. And it's the conscience of a person and it's the spiritual depth of the identity of the person all in the heart. That's why you want to take his body into you when you take communion, as it says here. Consume the thorns of my transgressions. Get rid of all the junk in me. Cleanse my soul and sanctify my reasonings. In other words, get my mind going in the right direction. Make firm my knees and body. Illumine my five senses. And that goes back to the chrismation. And I know that Tony will be chrismated, right? On the five senses. So it'll be really fresh for you, all that I'm saying here. Nail me to the fear of thee. Always protect and guard and keep me from words and deeds. Cleanse and purify me. Adorn me. Give me understanding and illumination. Show me to be a temple of thy one Holy Spirit and not the home of many sins. So that's a beautiful prayer. And you should try to say prayers of thanksgiving. You can't always say them after communion. Sometimes we're able to say them after communion if we have chanters that are, are doing it. And then, But people are kind of exiting the church then too, so it can become pro forma so much. But make sure you go home and even during the week sometime, read the prayers of thanksgiving and you'll realize how literal it is. These bodies are being transformed. And we have a relic of St. Mary of Egypt here in this church, which I brought to the church. And remember that beautiful Vespers and ceremony we had at the welcoming of St. Mary's to the church of St. Matthew's. What is the first thing that St. Mary asked of Zosimus? Communion. And then the second time he met her, what's the first thing she asked of him? How's the church? So that's all we really know of her conversation with the great monastic. Taking Holy Communion and how's the church? Way out in the desert, she asked those questions. I hope I didn't go in too many tangents or too many areas of reflection regarding this. It's good for us to always have a reminder of the, the beauty and the importance of taking Holy Communion within the church. Do you have any? But that question was very good, Paula. Very good. So that it makes you almost feel sorry for the devil, doesn't it? He would really, he can't stand me saying that, by the way. Feels. Yeah. St. Isaac would pray, but I'm not at that point because... Yeah. We're still praying against him. Or... I'm just, I'm praying God protects me because I wouldn't even know the deception that would come my way. with That guy, he's got lots of old experience. That, uh, but it really does, if you don't have someone to live for, I mean, it's remarkable. People can live negatively, but it gets old after a while, doesn't it? Really, it just doesn't, no matter, I can't get no satisfaction, you know. I, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I mean, there are lots of songs like this that talk about how there isn't anything out there. 
I was amazed that people don't actually listen to the words. I could give them a lecture. Do you think they'd invite me to do that after I still haven't found what I'm looking for? I got something. I got something for you. <clears throat> well, are there any further questions? <clears throat> No, he never does. He never takes his grace, mercy, and love from you. It's you who run away from it. And this can even go back to the temple. You've made yourself God. You, set your, you possess yourself. And you don't want anybody competing to be the center of your life. So you want to be the center of your life. God's grace and mercy is always there, but you don't want it. I always use the example of Supposing you really see the beauty of somebody else in them, but they don't see why you see the beauty in them that way. You know, like one enchanted evening across some crowded room, as it says in South Pacific, you may find a stranger uh, and not be a stranger anymore because you'll have a direct intimacy and uh, affinity with them. Have you ever met somebody that you had almost an immediate affinity for? And you couldn't really quite understand that. It seemed like their conversation merged with your own, like you've, you've known them all your life. So there's a certain interesting affinity that way. Anyway, uh, supposing though that the other person really doesn't care about you the way you see the beauty you see in them. I think that's where infatuation comes from. You know, I, I have a view of that. People get infatuated with not the person, but they actually find the beauty that God made in them. So they, they're trying to convince them of what they see in them. But then they confuse it with the person themselves rather than with their projecting to God. That's my own personal. I like to look at things positively. Well, you can send them flowers and they'll be mad, supposing they're... Or you can send them a gift and they'll be mad because they don't want it from somebody that they don't feel that way about. Well, that's the way I think it is with God. He's always giving us that love and that affection and that attention and those gifts. But some people don't want it. So for them, it's a real difficulty. It's a real difficulty. So that would be the answer I have for that. If you make yourself your temple, if the I becomes more important than the he, you're never going to want anybody in your life. That's the truth. It won't be just God. It'll be any other person. Any other thing isn't... C.S. Lewis said in The Four Loves that that's the saddest thing, that certain people's hearts never break for anything. They're just a drum that merely gives an echo of a sound, but nothing gets inside. And I was thinking... It's better to be a sponge than a drum. It's better to have holes in there that let things come in. It's better to take risks in there so that we have the love of God and others in us. That's hard to say sometimes. It's more comfortable being comfortable not letting anything in sometimes. Because you, you may not be overjoyed, but you won't be hurt either. That's what C.S. Lewis was talking about. But in, the, in this case, we have to, that'd be the answer to my question, and I guess it does go back to um, a temple in our time. And the reason I said that is because it's our time. My time. Your time. Will I be a, I should have said, a temple in my time. Will I be a temple in my own time, my particular place, my personal history? Will I make myself available to God so that he can make his home with us? That's my answer. You must forgive me. My answers are whole essays, aren't they? 
my answers are just huge. They just, and yet you still have me back every year. So that gives the year credit. So we're waiting for the bishop to improve on the verbosity of that. And then I just want to give all the footnotes. I went to the University of Michigan and they pounded that in our heads. Go back to primary sources, footnote everything you have. If it doesn't have a bibliography, you don't pass the course. So that's what I have now. So I can become insufferable as a bishop. But my priests are beautiful. They understand that eventually, after all the footnotes are in, I underline the point. Don't I, fathers? Good. So, any other questions about so far where we've gone? Grace, and, and, uh, and us believing as Orthodox Christians that our bodies are the temple of God, isn't that the reason why we condemn cremation? Yes, that's a major reason why. Very good. Yeah, cremation is making casual and superficial a temple. You know, it's... Of course, we can't, we are very fortunate to have this understanding that I just told you about. So I feel sympathy for people that don't have a full explanation and don't know any better, even in their own Christian bodies. And so they think, you know, that cremation is somehow acceptable. They can even do that reverently. So I'm not taking that away. But it's the lack of the teaching of the body that is on the understanding of the temple that they're lacking. And you see how great then our orthodoxy is and the sacramental church. We were baptized into his body. So Jesus said it so beautifully, unless you are born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. The born again is a literal thing. It's not just a thought. It's going into the font. It's coming out, baptismo being drown in the water. It's coming forth a new person. And in your case of chrismation, it's filling the form of what formerly was done in a not full way, see? So then you become in Christ completely with your chrismation. Isn't that a beauty? It's just so beautiful. It's so literal. It's so important to be baptized and chrismated and then take Holy Communion, especially... You know, I think even St. Gregory Palamas would always mention in first in order baptism and Holy Communion and, and the seven sacraments but, and like that. So this, this is, it is beyond anything we can describe as being put in his body. There, as soon as that happens, then you don't belong to yourself. As soon as you're Godparents and the, and the bishop and the priest say, this little one now will be baptized. They now belong to Jesus Christ. They share his DNA. They share his deoxyribonucleic acid. They share his whole destiny of dying to this world and living for the kingdom of God. This is the greatest gift anybody can give anybody. Being a human being made in the image and likeness of Christ. What does that really mean? It be means becoming by grace. All that Christ is and God is by nature. It's sharing the whole divine life, all the characteristics, all the powers and the qualities and the graces of, and the characteristics of divinity himself. Sometimes we fail to recognize the full meaning of what it means to be a human person. It's a great thing. Any questions then? That was a great question too. The body. Then, if I want to follow that up, of course the temple of God himself is Jesus Christ who went into the curtain, the temple with his own blood as it says in Hebrews chapter 8, and thereby he became the high priest, and maybe I'll talk about that tonight. And he rose again from the dead, having destroyed the body of corruption and giving us the body of incorruption. 
chapter 15, that which is sown a terrestrial body is raised a celestial body. That which is a lowly body puts on this immortal body, Philippians chapter 3. It's a great thing. There's mortality is swallowed up by immortality, chapter 5 and 2 Corinthians. All of that is the new body, Jerry. That has to go back to the dust because it has to be recreated. It's not ashes to ashes. It's never said that. No. Read Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. From dust thou art, yeah. and to dust thou shalt return, not as a punishment or a judgment, but as a new beginning. So even when God pronounced Adam going back to the dust after Adam sinned, you know, when we first look at it, we say, well, that's, look at what he did to himself. He destroyed himself. But Jesus was already in there talking about recreating him when he goes back to that dust. Don't, don't worry. You're going to the dust because you've separated yourself from me. But now I'm going to recreate you so that you unite yourself to me from that same dust. And whose dust is that? The Son of God himself. That's really a prophecy, fathers. From dust you shall return. And like Jeremiah said, I think in the 15th or 17th chapter of his prophecy, God told him to go to visit the potter. And when the potter had a flaw in the clay vessel, he broke it again and added moisture and then refashioned the pot. And that's what Jesus was talking about, what would, Christ was talking about, what would happen to us. So we're very fortunate to have this theology of the body, the resurrection body. And you know it's expensive these days for the, you know, people talk about that, but when you think about the majesty of being a temple of, of God, how do you ever just burn that. Just use it as something. But like I say, I'm not making judgments. I'm only talking within my own theology. And, there are pl and the people who don't know this and they innocently or even, even um, planned it because they don't have anything behind what they're doing, that doesn't mean God doesn't love them and can't save them and can't restore them, even bodily. But we who know this, that's what we have to honor. And have you ever known that when you have a funeral? I don't know if you pay attention to this. It's very important that the body's there. Now listen, fathers, you, you know this, but I'm always excited about saying it for the 20th time. <laughs> because, I, because that's why I live. I love this stuff. So you have the casket there, right? And what does the priest do if he has a deacon? He blesses the incense and gives the censer to the deacon. If he's not, he does it himself. He goes around the body just the way he does the altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Senses three times, three times, three times, three times. Because you see that little tabernacle on the altar? that contains the, the holy gifts, the pre-sanctified gifts, mm -hmm. they're in that body. That's the tabernacle right there. Thank you for some ideas for eulogies. And, there, <laughs> and there's the, and there's the, there's the, the further, mostly there's a, a little, there's candles set on each side of the west, when you turn the body and the head facing east, well, that's bringing out the candelabra from the candle stands from the altar, see? You're moving the altar to where the altar is, and you sense the... Did you ever think of that? Isn't that like... This is an amazing thing to, to further underscore or italicize what you just said. And that's a very good... You see that very good orthodox uh, instinct you have in intuition. That's so very... We would all just think of that. I mean, that you said that, right? 
Is there anything really greater than this? I wish we could tell the whole world this, really, to share it with them. Allow them to make their own decision. You can take this for what it is. But most, some people have never heard of this, never heard of the sacredness of the human temple and its body. Have no idea of what value they have. They're looking for, as I said, validation and affirmation from all these areas of popularity. But they don't know that God has already created them for an eternity with them so that he could live with them. And that they're so special that he's never going to make another one of them. They're irreplaceable, unrepeatable, unassimilable. They cannot be assimilated into anything else. They don't morph into anyone else. May I diverge a little? I haven't diverged yet, have I? <laughs> Thus far, no. Still have a way to go. You know, the, the, uh, the Freudians, and the, especially the Neo-Freudians, Norman H. Brown, Alfred Adler, um, and people like this, they, they talked about transference, and, and Freud did too, how a person without God, or because they did, you know, just psychologically on their own, always feel like a little child. They're always aware of hopelessness and helplessness, and they want to project onto a figure all of their hopes and dreams. So they tend to, now listen to this, create charisma. It's called transference. You take what's lacking in you, and for some reason someone hits or they match all of your ideals about what you would like to be. And then you make them into something they're not. You make them into a god. You stand in line to go to a concert. You spend exorbitant prices to go to a game to see somebody gain 127 yards on the ground. You vicariously live through the victory of a team. <laughs> That's fun to do. <laughs> well, actually, well, can I diverge? <laughs> actually, Cleveland's an up-and-coming team, I'll tell you. I shouldn't know these things. <laughs> Baker Mayfield, right? Okay. Don't take this on the tape, Quinn. No. no, I'm just kidding. So do you see what I'm saying? But we do that. We transfer onto these figures, and we create in them charisma. And one, one, of, the, one of them said, if there weren't charismatic personalities, we'd have to create them. Because... You can't live with a hopelessness and helplessness and a childlike paralysis without God. So it's either you have God, who is the object of your affections, or you transfer to another idol or person that which you, what you need. Either God or the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> either God. Well, well, hopefully... <laughs> since most of us haven't developed all this existential philosophy in regard to that, it can be well, I like the Cleveland Browns, but I love God. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> so that's we could, we could we could do that. So do you do you do you have a questions on all of that? Because I kept talking. Okay. <laughs> I, I've got a, a question just to see if you can give us a little insight on it. We used to have just occasional. Memorial service, Chrysostom's prayers, 40 days, and so forth. And lately, we really escalated, which is a nice thing. It's more people praying more. But it's almost every Sunday, um, memorial service. But I just wonder if you could just give us a little insight into what that's all about. Memorial services usually were in, in the church, but it, it changed in America because the United States, here's what happened. We settled Orthodox people here before any clergy got here. I mean, there were whole immigrations in the Gilded Age, 1890 to 1920, where people came from Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and all over the world, 
and made, and they used to, it's so beautiful, they called it this God-protected land. They came to the U.S. as a God-protected land, and they made their lives, and they became successful with their hard work, and they had social clubs. So they'd have clubs where they got together, and they, they appreciated their own culture. America enjoyed, you know, a, a plethora of cultures. They didn't discriminate as to what, because everybody would add to the color of the American fabric. And newspaper reporters would say that. So, and then bring me your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. But they all had social clubs. So orthodoxy started out in club areas where people came together. And then, of course, their orthodox instincts got the better of them, thank God. And they said, well, we have to have clergy here. We have to have our church here. So you'll find, and this is so beautiful, even in reading St. Raphael of Brooklyn and the different people, St. Sebastian Madari of the Serbian Church and St. Alexander Hodovitsky and St. John Kocurov and, and St. Herman of Alaska, St. Innocent, Lighten of the Elites and Apostle to Alaska, all these people would bring their traditions and they would build their church while they were trying to pay off the mortgages of their homes. They put their church first. These social clubs did. They would have these dinners and socials. That's where we still get all the dinners and socials we have now, although lots of people have lots of money. But still, it's become part of our cultural fabric we enjoy getting together, and a bishop enjoys coming to these. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's, it's that, so I had to add that. If people come to these social events, then the clergy came afterward and served the community. So that's what happened in, in these settings. And what was that question again? <laughs> what? Meeting of memorial services. Oh, the memorial, okay. And so these memorial, I got so, and I just... <laughs> These memorial services then were usually done on Saturday because that's the day of the martyrs. And we consider all those who fall asleep in Christ martyrs because they've witnessed for Christ, for the apostles and the martyrs. So the memorial services were done on Saturday, usually after Vespers. And now they're moved to Sunday because these immigrant communities, they didn't have a priest all the time. When they had a Sunday service, Everything was condensed into that service. Memorials, baptisms, merges. Everything while the priest was there because they couldn't afford full-time priests there. So this tradition became part of what it was, everything on Sunday. Now, because of travel time and work schedules and the world we live in, Sunday's that day where, once again, in an ironic, paradoxical thing, we're doing the same thing in the early, the early centuries of America, putting everything into that day. So that's where Memo Sundays are the day of resurrection. So, it, you know, the model is, Father, what's the model for memorials? You don't have to say, but I'm just using parenthetically. So, great, and the, the Sunday of Meet Fair Sunday, Meet Fair Saturday, where we remember all the dead. All Souls Saturday, and then there's one every Saturday throughout Lent. That's the model, because Sunday is the day of resurrection. Saturday is the day of Sabbath, the rest of the people. That's where it comes from. So now we have more and more memorials on Sunday. But you can move them to Saturday, but the people won't always be there on Saturday. So I still think it's a very beautiful thing to do. And then you can emphasize the resurrection character at the memorial. So that's the way it is. Because of necessity. Pastoral necessity, not doctrinal regularity. So the two are different. Doctrinal regularity, pastoral necessity. But it is a sign of people loving their people. You know. And I think that's what's happened here. It's not that we're having more death particularly. I think awareness. But I, think, yeah, I think it's awareness. I think people are getting more used to them before uh, remembering their uncle, their cousin, you know, people, and not somebody that died necessarily four days ago, it might be five years, two years, ten years. And so, but I, I, I think it's really great because we believe those prayers help those that have gone on. So they're getting prayed for more than they used to be. <laughs> so. Doesn't there seem also that 
the more spiritually sensitive we become, the more aware we are that they have not passed away, they've passed on. Sometimes I like my own phrases. <laughs> they have not passed away. They have passed on to be with God in glory. And we, the more spiritually sensitive we become, the more aware we are that they're here and the more we remember them. So it is in a sense, Father, that the community is becoming more mature in Christ by having more <coughs> memorials. In Christ. Because now, didn't we have such a really nice group of people to go to the Vesperal Divine Liturgy yesterday? Isn't that a beautiful liturgy for St. Anthony? And for me who bears his name. All of that is kind of awareness. I was telling uh, Craig and Cindy too about, can I tell you this beautiful story about being in the Temple Memorial of God? When I became a bishop, there's a certain institutional sensitivity, if I could put it that way. I have a hard time finding the words for it. Or it's a hypersensitivity to higher things. A hypersensitivity to higher things. I go home to Ironwood, Michigan, visit my sister, and the next day, I go to visit my parents in the cemetery. I go and I do the Trisagian prayers, and I just stand there and ask them certain questions. And when you're young, or maybe when we weren't so young, but when we had them on earth, do you remember going, already planning questions you wanted to ask your mom and dad, and by the time you got there, you didn't even ask any questions. You just sat there and had coffee with them, and it, Enjoy their company, whatever it was. You've heard. So I said the same thing when I got to the, the, the grave. I said, I'm doing the same thing I used to when you were here. And we all had a smile together on that. But I have to say something. And this is maybe, I think it is part of it, because there is more of a sensitivity I have almost naturally than I used to. I was going by certain of the graves. And I sensed more of a power from some of them asking me to stop. And I don't know how to relate that exactly. But I stopped. Stopped and said prayers for them. And knew that they were just sleeping there, and, but they were aware and they were at peace. How can a place where the dead are be so alive? It was a very alive place. There was the sound of, of a quiet security for them, a blanket of warmth in his eternal arms. And somehow no sadness there. I went by a little grave. Now you're going to know his name. You could barely see it. It was on one of those paths in cemeteries where it seems to be neglected. A tiny little pock-marked stone monument. Not more than 11 inches high. With some engravings in it. And I went down and I cleaned off the engravings. Because I had to say a prayer there. I was led by that. And his name was Frank Roby. And it says, not the year that he died, but baby. Mm. Baby. Frank Roby, baby. And I told him, I said, you know, you're just like Jesus. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes by his mother and he was wrapped in the tomb by his father. He went from life to life. 
with great peace I had, I left him. I said, don't forget now, you're like Jesus. To him. As natural as I'm speaking with you. As real as that. A hyper-spiritual sensitivity. Somehow. Well, that's just a story maybe some of you have had too. But it was a real pastoral, sacramental belief. Not just some things I teach doctrinally, but every, everyone is that little temple. What a little temple he was, see? Given to God. I've almost used my hour up. You can have another one. I've used the hour up. I've got a 7 o'clock hour. Well, it's a good thing we established ourselves first today as being the temple of God. I want to talk this evening about how being in the temple of God keeps us the temple of God. Being in the external temple of God keeps us the temple of God. But I'll give you first some things I'm going to say because the prayers in the church and the words of the church are supposed to become the thoughts of us. And if they become our thoughts, then we have purified minds and hearts and we are the temple of God. So rather than getting all that other information we have, We'll get our motivation from the thoughts and inspiration that we have from the thoughts of the church and the words of the church. Some people think that, you know, they're going to church and they're making a sacrifice to go to church. And I'm, because they're so busy and these things, they have good meaning. They, their, their schedules are tough to keep. But it's better to go to be clean spiritually, to replace that, those other tense and anxious thoughts with these peaceful thoughts, with these words of God, and then to take that as our treasure and go back into the world. So the more we're there and the thoughts we're getting there, the more at peace we'll be. And we'll be able to handle it, the things that are so scary for us out there. Aren't they frightening sometimes? Don't we go and we're frightened by relationships we have all of a sudden? We thought they were one way and they weren't that way and you're never really sure of what that is. Another example of making ourselves God. But when we go here, we have a relationship with Christ in the Holy Spirit for the Father which doesn't change. Which doesn't change. Enabling us also to be with the people who are also hearing the same things and doing the same things, they become our dependency, our security blankets, our comfort zone. Let me say, as I end, isn't it better to have the comforter as our comfort zone? That's true. Otherwise, you're not going to get through it. I mean, I know from our own experience. Without that, I would not be where I am today. Yeah, so true. You have to really work on it and believe it. I, I love that. That's how we work on it, by going to it. You know what's interesting, too? You know what divine liturgy is? Divine work. So we're working through it, to it, for him. There. Isn't it better to have the comforter as your comfort zone? Okay, that's it for this lecture. And then...
Tonight I'm going to talk about also how the people of Israel traveled through the wilderness, and I'll leave it, to make the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple in Jerusalem a return to paradise. And that's what it is. It's a return to paradise. And of course, that's realized ultimately in the temple of the church that you're going to build. Just as a way and aside, I'm glad you're, you're building a new church because, see, you have to build a new one. Because if you want the model of Scripture, they built it. They didn't inhabit it. They built it. They had to build it. And I'll say this again, but they took all that the gifts that the parting Egyptians gave them, chapter 11 and 12 of Exodus, and they used it to build the tabernacle. They didn't keep the gifts. And then, when David conquered all the Philistines, the Sadducees, the, the Persaites, the Gershites, the Hittites, the Havites, and all those ites, He didn't use that money. He kept it all for the building of the temple when Solomon built the temple. And he said to son Solomon that he couldn't build the temple because he was a warrior and he had blood on his hands. But the blood on his hands created the gold in the treasury for Solomon to build the temple. And the blood on Jesus' hands created the gold in the temple to give us eternal glory. 